I'm Blake Hargreaves, and this is Future Stops. The music we're hearing is a live recording of organist Xin Yuan performing in the 2017 Canadian International Organ Competition, or CIOC. This competition takes place every three years in Montreal and has the largest grand prize of any organ competition in the world. With the most recent iteration happening in 2017, this October would be when we gather for another edition of the CIOC, but of course that's not possible right now. Due to the pandemic, this year's competition has been modified into a festival of online performances and interactive events, and the competitors, who were selected by the jury this past March, are scheduled to compete in Montreal in October 2021. In celebration of this important Canadian pipe organ event, today on Future Stops, we're taking a look at Pipe Dreams, the runaway hit documentary that follows four competitors through the gauntlet of elimination rounds at the 2017 CIOC. Stacey Tenenbaum is the director, writer, and producer of this wonderful film, and she approaches the subject with no formal background in the pipe organ. Uh, I actually became aware of the CIOC uh, the very first year that it started, so in 2008. Um, I'm good friends, well, good old family friends with the uh, artistic director of the competition. And so he invited uh, me and my husband and my mother-in-law to go and see the final uh, concerts of the first year. And I was like, oh, this is, you know, two and a half hours or whatever it was, like on a horrible, hard church bench. I'm like, oh, it's not really my style. I don't really want to do it. But of course, we had free tickets and I was sort of obliged. And so we went and I'd never seen an organ being played before that time. And it just completely blew me away. Like I was so fascinated, both by just watching an organ being played and also by the music, which I was surprised by as well, just because they it wasn't what I was expecting. It wasn't church music necessarily. It was like, you know, modern pieces and, you know, obviously some Bach, which is beautiful and just a variety of stuff. So that I, it just completely introduced me both to the inter- instrument as well as to the to the music, which I thought was just incredible. I, I loved it and uh, the first time I saw it and I kept on going you know every three years whenever the competition would be on I would go uh, to the final concert and loved it and but I never thought about making a film about it which is really weird uh, and then I was uh, shooting my uh, another film that I was working on which is a film about shoe shiners and I was with uh, my cameraman we were having drinks after a shoot uh, and he's like hey you know I really want to do a film about that organ competition and I was like what like how do you know about that and he's like oh I don't know I just heard about it I've never gone but like you know I think it would be really cool to make a film about it and I'm like well I know the artistic director like let's do it it's really a great idea I don't know why I didn't have it so um so we had a meeting all of us and uh they were on board right from the beginning the expression pipe dream refers to the dreams of the opium pipe smokers of the 19th century and normally insinuates a plan that will never be realized. But the five young organists we get to know through the film are definitely not dreaming. One could be the youngest ever to win the competition. Another, the first to win a triple crown of pipe organ contests. And another, the first woman to be champion. They are five of the most talented young organists in the world, and their dreams are most certainly attainable. But the reality of the situation, as well as the tension of the competition, mounts through this compelling film giving us a sense of how much is at stake for these performers. Shen Yuan from Beijing is one of the competitors featured in this film, and she's been around organs all her life. Her father is known for popularizing the electric organ in China. I, of course, I started with him. Uh, it's early, uh, it's very convenient. Actually, you can easily to have license with your family. And it's also very stressful because you will have lesson all the time. During your breakfast, lunch, and uh, dinner, you're always having uh, your lesson. And uh, also people will judge you and critical you 
uh, no matter you play good or bad in this concert. Uh, if you play good, they say, of course, naturally. And uh, because you are professor's daughter, if you play bad, they will much more critical to you than the other students who play uh, bad in, in the same time. Uh, so I always want to show people that I am who I am. Bachelor, I always uh, I study only electronic organ, uh, but uh, since master, I changed my study to, to organ because I think pipe organ has longer cultural history uh, than electronic organ. Uh, I feel interesting to this instrument, and also I feel uh, very pity in the situation of organ is really bad, and nearly nobody knows this instrument. People keep thinking this instrument is going to die. You only can find it in museum or history book. But no, it's not. So I feel duty to develop it and research it. So after that, I studied in Japan first uh, to uh, study my first PhD. And later, I asked myself, of course, PhD is the top level of education. You can stop. Uh, as an aging girl, it's always time that uh, you ask asking yourself, Did I marry somebody and have baby and uh, uh, helping the family? Well, what I ask myself is, uh, do I still feel my knowledge is not enough? Do I want more? And so this is the reason I go to Berlin, Germany, to study uh, my second doctor degree. So uh, I studied there in Berlin six years, but during the six year, I didn't uh, give up my work in China. During the six year, I fly between Beijing and Berlin every month, uh, at least two or three times. So during that time, I think it's a great time I bring knowledge, what I studied in Berlin, immediately go back to China and teach my students. For Shen Yuan, the pipe organ is a deep and constant commitment, as it is for all of the performers we follow in the film. Back home, each of these musicians is used to being seen as the exceptional, outstanding talents that they are. But together at the competition, they find themselves shoulder to shoulder with others who are at the same level, making for some poignant social dynamics. Uh, they were an interesting group, actually. I mean, uh, the North American ones kind of knew each other because uh, I think there's sort of this circuit of competitions. <laughs> so, and, and the organ world's not that huge. So I, I guess they knew each other. So I'll see uh, Chris uh, was one of the players that was actually, uh, he's from Texas, but he was studying at McGill. Uh, and he was very, very good friends with Nick Capazzoli, who was another competitor who was from Pittsburgh, but was studying at McGill as well. So the two of them were studying together at McGill, and they'd also been studying together at Oberlin prior to coming to McGill. So they were like kind of old friends. And, you know, I mean, Alsi was quite afraid of Nick's skill, and he talked about that quite a bit. But they're really, really different players. Uh, so it was interesting that they have just different strengths and different ways of playing. And then there was um, Thomas Gaynor, who's from New Zealand. And he is studying at Eastman. Uh, and Thomas and Alsi had a bit of rivalry going. Uh, they competed before. Ta uh, Alsi had beaten him twice. You know, this was the third time they were kind of coming up against each other. So we we uh, we were sort of following that like friendly rivalry. But they were friends. Like they would go out for drinks after you know practice, and they were buddies. Like everybody was really nice. There was no kind of you know putting razor blades on the uh, key or something, which apparently they do in China in piano competitions, because uh, the other person I was following was a girl from Beijing. Her name is Yuan Chen, and uh, she she was a bit older than the others. Uh, she's a professor at the Beijing Conservatory of Music, 
Uh, and now Yuan Shen is sort of building up the pipe organ in China. So she was really, really determined just to, you know, bring the pipe organ to, to a Chinese audience and, you know, bring home the win for China, I guess. Uh, and for her father, who was kind of, he's been her teacher and her mentor for many years. So uh, she didn't know any of the other competitors at all. Uh, and neither did Sebastian, who was from Leipzig, and he was the youngest uh, competitor. He was only 19, which actually I think he was the youngest ever to compete in CIOC. Um, and he didn't know the other competitors either. So uh, so there was like these, you know, North Americans kind of hung together, but uh, everybody was really collegial and really nice to each other. So the, the time in, during the competition is very exciting. Uh, I meet a, a lot of friends, uh, and they are they are all very interesting the young people. Mm, at one side, I feel very exciting to meet them. Another side is it can be a lot of pressure to to compete with them. During the competition, I found that uh, North American team, North American students, they uh, like to eat banana before they have competition and play. But me and the five team and uh, like uh, Mona uh, and other students from Europe, we like to eat chocolate, and we are we think it's very interesting. Uh, we separate the the chocolate team and the banana team. Chocolate and bananas, these are the performance enhancing nutrition supplements of seasoned competitors, sustaining themselves through the grueling process of the many selection rounds before they reach the final group of four. To tell a story like this, Tenenbaum attends every aspect of the competition, starting with the initial round of jury selections. So what they do is they have people send in CDs, uh, and that's a very set repertoire. They have, I think, four different pieces, or maybe they have six pieces and they have to choose four. There's not a lot of variety. Uh, and there's a judging that goes on secretly, and it's a blind judging. So they everyone gets a number. The judges have no idea who they're voting for. Uh, and over four eight-hour days, they listen to these CDs <laughs> and uh, mark everyone, and then eventually uh, whittle that. I think there were 55 or so uh, that year, and they whittled it down to 20. Um, so I actually went, it's not in the film, but I went to all of that, those four full days of organ music. And I, I kind of consider that to be my education because I, I don't really have a musical background and I, I kind of, you know, don't know that much about organ or didn't at the time. Um, so I really learned about it. I mean, when you hear eight hours a day, the same pieces played over and over again, I kind of got an idea of like who was good and, and what the differences were and sort of how it was working. And then from the 20 competitors, they actually had three rounds where uh, elimination rounds. So um, the first round, all 20 play, and they it's Bach round, so it's a, an early music. So um, they all have a, a little bit of a smaller repertoire game that they're able to play. Uh, and then that got whittled down, I believe, to 12. And then from 12, they have a second round at a different church with a different organ. And um, that is an open program. They're allowed to play what they want, I believe. And then the third round uh, is they whittle it down again to, I think there were four in the final round. And that's at Notre Dame Cathedral in Montreal. Uh, and they, they have like this program. They can do anything they want at that point. Um, so it's uh, it's really rigorous. They don't have a lot of time to practice. So we, we were with them the entire two weeks, like filming. Uh, so they don't have tons of time to practice. So they really have to, part of the challenge of the competition is just learning those organs and being able to quickly figure out how they're going to, uh, how they're going to play on each of them and, and uh, the different registrations that they're going to do. They have to sort of figure that out very, very quickly. So it's a lot of pressure uh, and it, uh, the, it's just, it's really a thrilling competition. It is certainly a thrilling competition to watch. And as the competitive tension mounts, it becomes even more suspenseful and dramatic as we start to wonder how this pressure affects the dynamics between the young virtuosos. I think we are friends. I, I don't think the, the... I think some music movie or ballet dance movie, they're trying to, uh, to say that uh, the 
the colic are try to kill each other. And uh, the, dump, uh, uh, the ballet dancer put the glass uh, into another uh, dancer's shoe, or somebody tried to cut his finger. I don't think that's happening in this kind of CLC, this high level uh, competition stage. So they are not a beginner of competition or study. They know how to respect each other. And uh, I always tell myself, there's a lot of knowledge that my professors uh, teach me. There are also a lot of uh, knowledge that my colleagues or same age organists can teach me. So when I don't, when I don't have the uh, room to play, uh, I always come to the church, listen to the other players. And then um, you talk, we talk with the other uh, organists. We tell them the, how to, how, for example, I, I played in this church already, how hard to resist it, what you should avoid. In. This kind of information, we will not hiding it. So I think in future, for example, I know the friends, uh, we became friends, you know, Elsie Craves, Thomas Skinner, Nikki, Nicholas. Uh, I think it's a great chance for me to know my generation, what they're playing. I mean, like I said, it it started with just getting permission, right? I mean, that's always the first step for a filmmaker. So, um, and I was lucky that I had that connection and that they trusted me. And and I think what was pretty astounding is they they never stopped me from doing anything. (laughs) Like, they just gave me full access, which was amazing. Like, I could film them, you know, behind the scenes. I could film the judges. Like, they just let me do everything. So, the competition had a lot of trust in me, but then it's also getting the competitors to trust me, (laughs) which was maybe a little bit harder, right? Because they weren't entirely clear on, like, what I was going to do. And some of them thought maybe it's going to be, like, a reality show and I'm going to want them fighting. And I'm like, oh, no, it's not like that. It's like a serious documentary. So, um, but I spent a lot of time with them. I spent probably, uh, you know, four months, uh, several visits uh, where I would, um, you know, go home with them, spend time with them, you know, going for drinks and dinner and meeting their family. And uh, so as I did more and more filming with them, they got much more comfortable with me. And I think you can kind of feel that in the film as well. Some of the time, I think Stacey is, uh, very hard to, to catch me uh, and to feel me uh, before each round because I'm a little um, try to escape the, uh, from the camera. Uh, I want my own time and be free, be concentrate. I know that my energy is very limited. If I uh, I can't focus on on preparing and also uh, how to be. Um, how to be relaxed in front of camera. Uh, but I think uh, Stacy still did their, uh, her best to, to catch me in different church and uh, what I feel, what I look like. They kind of got used to being filmed. But each one, it was a little bit of a, a negotiation. Like uh, there was this period where you'll see in the film where they're in the green room, so where they wait and practice or before they go on. And that was a very, very, very stressful period for them. And um, some of them wanted us to be there. Some didn't want us. Uh, and then some of them didn't want us to put microphones on them because it was going to interfere with their playing. So er- each one was like a little bit of a negotiation to kind of figure out what what they would be comfortable with. But like I said, I'd put in so much time with them before that that most of them really let us in for everything. Like we're, we're there all the time, as you know, you'll see in the film. It's uh, where we're, you really feel like you're part of the competition.
You're listening to the Future Stops podcast, an initiative of the Royal Canadian College of Organists. My name is Blake Hargreaves, and I'm your host as we explore the world of the 21st century organ. We've just heard today's feature performance, Etudes No. 3 and 5, from Bruce Mathers' Six Etudes pour Orgue by Shen Yuen on the organ at Notre Dame Basilica of Montreal during the 2017 CIOC. Shen Yuen was awarded the Richard Bradshaw Audience Prize but did not ultimately take home first prize at the 2017 CIOC. That award went to McGill graduate Elsie Chris from Texas. A busy performer like Shen Yuen takes it all in stride. I feel relaxed, actually, uh, that I, I had a long, deep breath in and breath out. After that, I had my other project and um, concert that I need to fight for. Uh, and then I need to I have no time to to cry, to judge, to to critical to myself, and then I have to move on. Uh, I told my father I say that uh, I didn't got the top three, uh, but I went to the final round, and my father say this is all already uh, all that he's expecting, and uh, he say that uh, I can't believe you are my daughter. How could I educate such a good musician like you? What I did, and uh, he, he tried to um, comfort me, uh, but uh, I say, ah, fine, come on. But I'm not crying, but if try to convince him, if uh, comfort comfort me, then I will even going to cry. So uh, I come back home soon, and uh, life is continue. We need to move on. And uh, I am very appreciate to what CIOC gave me. And I don't think I lose anything in this competition. People were still always, I never got the feeling, like even though it was competitive, I, I kind of got the feeling that it was more them competing against themselves, you know, uh, that they wanted to pre- perform to the best of their ability. Um, and everybody was kind of rooting for each other. It was a really nice uh, feeling. And also, the competitors, an interesting thing about this competition is that when people got eliminated, uh, they still stayed for the f- full two weeks of the competition. Then I feel the competition is a, a practice for being a musician in future because uh, after you graduate, be a professional musician, you have the, every concert for you is a competition. You need to have a ability to to uh, design your your life schedule. For example, before a concert, or before two or three days, or one week, or one month before it, what should you eat, and uh, what uh, you should do sports, and to have uh, the energy to, to make your muscles strong. But how to sleep well is also a technique. It's not that easy. That's all of the hard to be a musician. It's not the the one hour or five minutes you play on the organ. It, it's all your life. Uh, you need to have the ability to, to design it. Then you can show the one good minute on the stage. Xin Yuan's commitment and dedication to music makes for many good moments during the documentary, and it mirrors the filmmaker Stacy Tenenbaum's dedication to her craft. Much like her previous work, Shiners, a documentary about shoe shiners, Pipe Dreams explores a small and very specific community, but in a way that appeals to a much wider public. All of my screenings, I've, I've done a lot of screenings at film festivals, and we also had a theatrical run here in Montreal, which I think is pretty amazing for an organ film to have a three-week theatrical run. But, you know, so that, that says something right there that, you know, audiences did respond. Film festivals are, like, complicated, but the ones that I got into all love the film and I think more important was that audiences really really responded to this film like just even people who had no interest in organ music or thought they didn't like organ music they came up to me after and they're like wow it was like they loved it and they were on the edge of their seats and uh, in Toronto what what was really interesting is that um, when we had that concert we had a live organ concert uh, after the film screened and I think over half the audience that was their first organ concert that they'd ever been to so the film kind of got them interested in going to see live music which is wonderful 
So uh, I think that, you know, for me, the important thing was was getting people turned on to the organ and organ music and getting them to understand it a bit more in a very accessible way. So when I was making this film, I actually was said to the people at the CIOC that I want to make the film for people like me who might not be musicians, who might not know about the organ, and to kind of introduce them to the instrument and to the repertoire. And after all this time immersing herself in the pipe organ world, shooting and editing this film, what does Stacy think of the organ world as an outsider looking in? Well, I don't know. I mean, I was with the young people mostly, right? Because they, they were the kids. So I think that, I don't know if it's representative of the entire organ community. Um, I think maybe this is the future of the organ community that I was working with. And uh, I was surprised just how cool they were. <laughs> Like they were just like normal, cool people that had other interests other than being in church 24-7. Uh, and I was really surprised also at the music. Like uh, um, Nick is really into modern organ organ music, which I, you know, had no idea even existed, <laughs> which is very ignorant. I've learned a lot since I started. Somebody saying the organ uh, music were, is getting smaller. I don't think so. Because somebody said... Uh, Organ music is, uh, organ instrument is not developing. It's only playing what composer who are died already, but to playing what they composed. Just because the highlights of the organ history is too much brightened. So people put attention on history, uh, too much and forgot that the organ music is still developing. Uh, there's still a lot of organ contemporary composer working hard on it. You know, people always associate organ with church uh, because they are in churches, I guess. Uh, but it's not necessarily church music that you have to play when you're playing the organ. And I mean, it's beautiful to be in a church. You don't have to be religious to go to a church. I mean, the architecture is fantastic. Like, and, you know, filming in the, uh, the film, I got to be in the, in the organ loft. So you get to see the church from a really entirely different perspective and the art and everything that goes into it. So I think that's one of the beauties of the organ is that you can enjoy the music, but you can also enjoy the architecture and the art of the space itself. So I really like the organ community. And I mean, organists have all been really very encouraging about the film and very kind and, and uh, supportive of the film. So that's been great for me. So no, I've, I can only say that I've had great experiences with the organ community. I'm happy that they've embraced me as they have. The pipe organ community can be equally happy to be presented in such an intimate and compelling fashion in this eminently watchable film. If you haven't seen it yet, you can find links and more information about the film on our website, as well as info on how to see this year's CIOC online performances. You can also find pictures, videos, and ongoing discussions about every episode on our Facebook page and Instagram account under Future Stops Podcast. I'd like to thank our guests today, Stacey Tannenbaum and Shen Yuan, for sharing their experiences from the making of this documentary. And thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to Future Stops so you never miss an episode. Future Stops is a podcast from the Royal Canadian College of Organists, produced by Andrew O'Connor, with Haley Raymond as community manager, and executive producer Elizabeth Shannon. And I'm your host, Blake Hargreaves.